So I wanted to talk about the history of astronomy. And I called this a shallow and incomplete look at early astronomy because there's a lot more out there that I didn't dig up. And then also there's a lot of things that were accomplished but weren't necessarily recorded or the records were destroyed. But I think this is important to talk about because even though science and especially astronomy has made light years worth of advances, especially in the last 100 years, it's important to put that knowledge in the context of human history. So to look at how the earliest astronomers, astronomers made their measurements, how astronomy was used in a practical way, and how it interacted with cultures and impacted historical events. So my talk is split into two parts. Um, at first, I'm going to talk about applied astronomy. So how it had to do with architecture, farming, sailing, and then early observatories. And then the second part is going to talk about astronomical phenomena and so how stuff like uh, lunar or solar eclipses impacted cultures or even historical events. We're going to start off about 9,000 to 7,000 years ago in Africa at a place called Nabta Playa. It's about 100 miles south of Cairo and um, they were able to do carbon dating from campfires around the area to get um, those uh, time estimates. But this is actually before any recorded human history, so we didn't have any form of like writing or hieroglyphs or anything like that. But they think that this was definitely used for astronomy in some way. Um, the placement of the stones is possibly a calendar, but archaeoastronomers think that the stones could align with certain constellations. But what I think is exciting and cool about this is that even before humans knew how to like write or like transfer knowledge by like any form of writing, they were doing astronomy. So we're gonna stay in Egypt, but go forward in time and talk about farming. So this paper um, that was authored by Nikki Forov and Petkorova and published in 2012 in the Bulgarian Astrophysical Journal suggests that the Egyptians knew that the flooding of the Nile River coincided with the appearance of the star Sothis or Sirius. And this hieroglyph, the symbol, um, the upper one is for Sirius, and the lower one are flood season, and um, they're seen associated with each other here. And so that's part of the evidence for this. Um, but it's a really interesting paper if you want to read more about it. All right, we are going to go to the other side of the world now and talk about sailing. Um, so Polynesian sailors use um, these double hull canoes, and they navigated everywhere within the triangle on this map. So all the way from New Zealand to Easter Island to Hawaii, and there's not much in between besides ocean. So that's really impressive. And they did this by using a combination of stars, ocean currents, and wind patterns to navigate. And they made it to Hawaii, all the way to Hawaii in about 400 CE. Um, so what they did is they used stars near the horizon as guides, and when, when those stars rose um, so too high to get followed easily, then they were able to switch stars. And on the right, you can see a star chart that they would have used. Um, so it shows the directions and which constellations would be at the horizon at different directions. And if you've ever seen the movie Moana, they go into that and use it. And that's pretty cool. There's a movie about it. All right, now we're going to talk about architecture. Um, so in Central America, Chichen Itza is a pyramid that was built about 600 to 900 CE, but its very architecture was influenced by astronomy. So it was built in such a way that on the spring equinox, which just happened for 2020 in March 19th, so a couple weeks ago, and when the sun aligned for the equinox, which is when there's an equal amount of day to equal amount of night, the sun lit up the side of the pyramid so that it looked like a snake because it was not in honor of Quetzalcoatl, who is um, the feathered snake. So um, this is one picture taken during the equinox, but I found this other picture where it's been lit up at night just to highlight the snake. So the steps of the pyramid become the body of the snake and the snake's head is underneath. <clears throat> so my parrot Rufus, who you may have heard uh, shouting in the background, thinks he has a lot in common with Quetzalcoatl. And here's his evidence. So they both have sharp beaks, great feathers, and a can-do attitude for world, world domination. So he thinks somebody should also build a temple for him. If you're interested, let me know. All right, so we're gonna move just a little bit south of Chichen Itza and go to Zunantunic in Belize, where there's, um, these are Mayan ruins. 
and they also had pyramids and um, I thought this picture in the center was really illustrative of how astronomy and their culture influenced the architecture of these buildings. So as the sun's path, you know, it rises in the morning, it rises with the pyramid and then it peaks and then it goes down and that's tied into, um, the, you know, like the, where the home of the gods are and the home of the dead are, home of the dead are. And I really like that they have like the astronomy influence the architecture along with their culture and beliefs. Uh, we're gonna go back to Chichen Itza very quickly. Uh, this is one of the first surviving observatories. It was built about 600 to 900 CE. And that little dome at the top there was so people could go out and they used it to see if anyone far away would be visiting them and to prepare correctly, depending on the visitors, but they also could use it um, for like a better platform to look at the night sky, because that was also something that was very important to them. All right, we're going forward in time quite a bit into the other side of the world, now to Maraga Observatory. So it's in East Azerbaijan province in Iran. Um, it was built in 1259 CE and is directed by Nasser al Tusi. So I found these really cool um, commemorative stamps from Azerbaijan. Um, and it's a cool picture, but I really like the diagram on the right, which shows a model of what the observatory looked like on the inside. And so there's a little hole at the top for light to come in. And then it basically projected on that curved back wall and that lets you know the angle of the object coming in. And so that was really good for like, if you wanted to make accurate measurements. So Tusi was a really interesting astronomer. And I highlighted a few of um, what I thought his uh, really cool results were in here. So first of all, he came up with a better planetary model than Ptolemy. So Ptolemy was this old astronomer who had like this crazy idea that like the planets were going into retrograde motion and I never liked it when I learned it. So it was, it's exciting to me to learn that somebody else had a better planetary model than him. Um, but the other thing I liked was this quote. So it says, the Milky Way, i.e. the galaxy, is made up of a very large number of small, tightly clustered stars, which, on account of their concentration and smallness, seem to be cloudy patches. Because of this, it was likened to milk in color. So this is really impressive that he's discerned the reason why the Milky Way looks the way it does. Um, and without like a lot of like the fancy instruments that we have now. So I thought that was really interesting. Rufus does too. Okay, so we're gonna move over to China about the same time, 1276 CE. And this is a, basically a giant sundial and it was used to measure time as a function of location. And they built about 10 of these spanning from Central Asia, Central Asia all the way down to Vietnam. And they use this to measure the circumference of the earth. Here's another observatory, Uluq Beg Observatory. It was built by Uluq Beg. It's in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and it was built about 1420 CE. So Ulugh Beg did a lot of work, good work too. Um, and he corrected errors in star catalogs. He accurately determined the length of sidereal year, and he determined the Earth's axial tilt. Um, here's another observatory, Istanbul Observatory of Takiya Din. It was built in 1577 CE and it was destroyed about three years later. And the reason why is because there was a comet and the Takiya Din said, oh, this means that we're gonna be able to conquer Persia. And instead this big plague happened. Um, so people weren't very happy about that. Um, but I found uh, from a library, I found a lot of cool images of instruments in his observatory. Um, which you can see below and it seems like there's like a lot of instruments that were meant for measuring angles of things because that was really important. Um, and then lastly I wanted to talk about this astronomer. Her name is Wang Zhenyi. So she was born in 1768, uh, died in 1797, but um, one of the many things that she did, so she proved how equinoxes moved and how to calculate the movement. And she wrote books to explain the lunar and solar eclipses, but why I specifically wanted to highlight her is because she's one of the examples of astronomers building models. So at some point she actually went out in her garden and she built a model of a lunar eclipse 
you know, sounded really awesome from the description of it. Um, she also wrote a lot of books about math and found ways to simplify math to make it easier to teach others. All right, so that's the end of the practical part of astronomy. Um, but now we're going to talk about how astronomical phenomena impacted cultures, and we're going to start with aurorae. Um, so here's an example on the right of an aurora. And the indigenous people of North America had a lot of different ways to explain the northern lights. The Saltos interpreted the lights as the dancing of human spirits. Uh, on Nunavik Island, they had a myth that it was a walrus playing ball with a human skull. And the Sami, who are a tribe in Lapland, thought that the lights came from the souls of the dead. Um, okay, so next up are lunar eclipses. Um, here's a really nice picture of a sequence of lunar, lunar eclipse happening on the lower right. And we know now that it's the Earth's, Earth's shadow blocking the moon temporarily from our vision. But the Incans believed that a jaguar attacked and ate the moon. And after eating the moon, the jaguar might come to Earth to eat people. So to prevent this, they would shake their spears at the moon and make a lot of noise to scare it away. So this is, you know, like one of many examples of an astronomical event influencing how a culture behaves. Um, an interesting thing with the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamians is they saw the lunar eclipse as an assault by seven demons on both the moon and their king. So to protect their king, they would temporarily install a surrogate king. So um, it looks like people don't see lunar eclipses as a very good thing, which is understandable. The Loiseno tribe would sing chants or prayers to heal the moon during eclipse. Um, and then now about 18, 800 BCE, the Babylonian astronomers have discovered that lunar eclipses have a 223 month period. So it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition is that the Babylonians have had this huge um, amount of observations because 223 months is a long period of time. And if you don't have a good way of passing down information, then you're not necessarily gonna have records and a good way to measure the difference in time between when these events happen. All right, solar eclipses. So the Ojibwe tribe would fire flaming arrows at the sun to reignite it. Um, and then here's a really interesting historical event. So the Medes and the Lydians were fighting a battle that happened during the eclipse of 585 BC. Like, what are the odds of that happening? And so when it started, when the sun started to disappear, both sides interpreted the event as a sign of displeasure from the gods, and they ended the battle immediately. So, you know, astronomy has also been involved in, like, a lot of peaceful things, which is nice. Um, and then lastly, the Incans got very concerned when an eclipse happened because it meant that the sun god, Inti, got upset, so they would offer sacrifices to try to find ways to make it better. Now, as far back as about 700 BC, Mesopotamians were predicting solar eclipses. Chinese astronomers could understand and predict eclipses around 200 CE, and it looks like there's evidence that the Mayans also were able to predict them, but too much was destroyed for it to know for sure. So this image is from the Dresden Codex, and it looks like it's, um, it has to do with solar eclipses, but again, you know, we're not really sure. Um, all right, so Eta Carinae is a star that goes on to outburst, and <clears throat> it went into outburst in the 1840s. And what was interesting is that the Burong Aboriginal people started to incorporate it in their oral traditions after it went into outburst, but it was not a part of it before. So they were paying attention to the night sky and this is something that they could see and they noticed and they thought it was important enough that they kept a record of it. All right, and then last day I wanna talk about supernova 1054. So this is a supernova that went off in 1054 CE and it was observed and recorded by Chinese and Japanese astronomers. So it was about six times brighter than Venus and it was visible during high noon. So on the right, um, this is from Stellarium, which is a really awesome astronomy program, and I recommend you check it out. And these people basically were able to go back in time, and um, this is an image of what it would have looked like back then. And on the left is this supernova remnant. So that's what it looks like now. Um, it's called the Crab Nebula. But the point is that this was really, really bright if you could see it during the day, especially if you compare it, it was brighter than the moon. And the moon is already pretty bright. 
And so in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, there's strong evidence that this petroglyph is a recording of supernova 1054. And the explanation for it, the interpretation of the petroglyph is something like this. If you stand at that spot when the moon is directly overhead um, and you look out in the direction of the star, you're going to be looking at the Crab Nebula, which is the supernova remnant of supernova 1054. So here's a timeline covering everything that we went over in this talk from, you know, before we had any kind of recorded history to pretty recently with Ada Karani. <clears throat> and while some of the earlier discoveries in astronomy are still in use today, you know, others are not so much. But maybe in 100 years, the groundbreaking discoveries of today were going to follow on the same path of either being on the right track or being utterly wrong. But the important things, humans were and still are learning more about the universe that we're in. <clears throat>